Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the Institute for International and European Affairs, uh, I'd like to welcome you to today's talk by Ambassador Peter Thompson, who is the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Ocean. Ambassador Thompson will speak to us on the uh, subject of the ocean and small island developing states. Uh, this is the seventh lecture in the uh, 2021 Development Matters series which is sponsored by Irish Aid. Uh, Ambassador Thompson will speak for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll go over to a Q&A session with the audience. A few housekeeping points first. Uh, both Ambassador Master Thompson's initial presentation and uh, the Q&A session will be on the record. Please feel free to send in questions or comments as they occur to you during the event. Um, and we will do our very best to get to them. You use the chat function at the bottom of the screen. Please also feel free to uh, join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. We will also be live streaming today's discussion. Uh, so a very warm welcome to those of you who are joining us via YouTube. We're delighted to have as our guest speaker today, Ambassador Peter Thompson. Peter, in his role as the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Ocean since 2017, has been driving global support for the implementation of Sustainable Development Goal 14, in which, as you know, the world pledged to conserve and sustainably use, use uh, the ocean, um, seas and marine resources for sustainable development. He's a founding co-chair of the Friends of Ocean Action uh, and is a supporting member of the High Level Panel for Sustainable Ocean Economy. Peter is also a former president of the UN General Assembly. He served during the year 2016 to 17. Uh, he was the permanent representative of Fiji to, to the United Nations from 2010 to 2016, during which time he was also elected as president of the International Seabed Authority uh, Assembly and uh, um, and Council. Peter was an early champion of what came to be known as the Sustainable Development Goals. And I remember with great gratitude my uh, close cooperation with him in that respect, and in particular what he did as PGA to follow up immediately on the achievement of the SDGs. He made that the centerpiece of his time as president of the General Assembly and really put the SDGs on the map internationally while he was in that role. Um, he's a close friend of mine and I'm delighted as is, as is Jill uh, uh, that he has agreed to speak to the Institute this morning. He last spoke here in uh, February 2019. Before giving Peter the floor, I'd like to uh, ask Rory de Burka, the Director General of Irish Aid, the Irish Government's Development Cooperation Programme to say a few words. Rory. Thanks, David, uh, and hello, Peter. Um, it's it's really great to have this opportunity to to I suppose welcome uh, Peter um, and to underline I think through 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 the, the medium of Peter's presence the importance which uh, Irish Aid and the Department of Foreign Affairs attaches to to questions around the ocean and uh, small island developing states. Um, Peter was in COP last week. We had a very good discussion with, with Minister uh, Simon Coveney. I think building on it on, on a series of discussions, including one in, in Cork a number of years ago at Seafest, uh, where you know I think some important conversations took place, including with John Kerry, who has taken a particular interest in, 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 in oceans questions and uh, will be um, hosting uh, very shortly his own Our Ocean Conference in Palau, while Peter is doing a One Ocean Summit in, in in France. And I think these pick up, um, I think, the importance which uh, we have to attach to, to our oceans. You know, they are reservoirs, great re reservoirs of biodiversity. They're also in a climate context, both a source of hope, but also a source of challenge with sea levels potentially rising and bringing the very existence of, of a number of, of, of small island states uh, into question over the next 20 to 30 years. You know, oceans are I think a really, really pregnant question for us all over the next period. Um, for Ireland, you know, we describe ourselves as a as a small island from time to time, but in the context of small islands, actually, we're quite a big small island. Um, we are like most small islands, 
you know, a, a big ocean state. And I think, you know, if, if we take our entire territory into account, you know, including our, our territorial waters, we're about the third largest country in the EU. And I think that is a reminder to us of, of the power that we have in our waters, but also the responsibility to protect. Uh, and one of the ambitions which, which Minister Coveney has is that Ireland, you know, delivers on, on, on the promise to, to, to designate 30% of our, of our territorial waters as a, as a biodiversity reserve. And that's a challenge which I think other countries are also beginning to pick up. And if we do that, we make a contribution uh, to, to addressing climate change but not, and, and biodiversity loss, but not enough on its own merits. Um, also, one of the groups that we have become even more friendly with over the last few years has been small island developing states. In 2019, uh, at Seafest, uh, we published uh, our small island developing state strategy, the first time Ireland had such a strategy. And that's been a really interesting series of conversations which we've taken forward with those countries. We, as part of that strategy, agreed to meet with, with representatives of small island states in what we call a Talanoa format, which is a way of, of conversing. We put an Irish word in it, Kaylee, which isn't about dancing, it's about partying and listening. Um, and it's about exchanging perspectives. And I think one of the real learnings from, for us and one of the things which are really trying to build into our development programming and our broader foreign policy is the need to respond to the urgent um, crisis facing small island developing states around climate change and sea level rise. And hopefully we lend not just our funding, but also our voice and, and hopefully our help uh, in addressing some of those questions. Um, a few milestones coming up, uh, the COP15 negotiations in Kunming and the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon, I think are really interesting moments when we can address ocean issues. And I'm sure Peter will touch on them as, as, he, as he goes. So I think this is gonna be a really interesting uh, and learning um, and rich discussion. I'm really looking forward to what Peter says. I think there's a lot here that we will need to take forward in our diplomacy, in our aid policy over the coming years. And I think Peter, uh, you're very welcome to, to Dublin for, uh, for today's discussion. I really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thanks Rory. Um, Peter, over to you. Thank you very much for those words of welcome. Uh, in, with your typical modesty, David, you didn't mention the fact when you're talking about the work we did on the Sustainable Development Goals that it was UN Ambassador Macharia Kamau of Kenya who guided us towards the, you know, one of the UN's great achievements in its existence, which was the, the uh, crafting of those uh, Sustainable Development Goals and their universal adoption. What a year that was, 2015, along with the Paris Agreement. And uh, you should be rightly acknowledged for your leadership in getting us there. Um, and uh, Rory, you made mention of those two uh, ocean meetings. Uh, so I'll, I'll just give you the dates for them. Um, and I was speaking to uh, Special Envoy Kerry and the president of Palau about them while I was in Glasgow last week. And I will be going to Paris uh, tomorrow, in fact, for meetings with the French government about their meeting. Now, just to clarify, both these meetings, of course, are not UN meetings, but I have said to the organizers of both that they're very important um, lead ups to the UN Ocean Conference, which will be held in Lisbon in the middle of next year. So just for the dates for them, for, for President Macron's One Ocean Summit, uh, you've heard of his One Planet Summit. This is very similar to the organization of those. Uh, the One Ocean Summit will be held in Brest in France uh, on the, uh, let me get the, the correct dates here, the 11th and 12th of February. And then five days later in Palau, uh, the US and Palau will co-host the Our Oceans Conference. Uh, and that will be from the 16th to the 17th of February. So I've assured everybody concerned that I'll be at both, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of people like me who will make the trek. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, not everybody is required to be at those meetings. Unlike the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon, where we are all required to be there, all 193 member states have uh, mandated that, and. Uh, we all have responsibility for SDG 14's implementation. 
So I, I'm going to go to the text of my speech now, David. And uh, okay. for the mercy of our listeners, I've chopped it down to about 12 minutes uh, and uh, with a view to you know spending more time on Q&A, which most people are more interested in, I think. So here we go. So ladies and gentlemen, first of all, all courtesy is observed and many thanks to the Institute of the International and European Affairs for giving me the privilege of addressing you all. In my remarks to you today, I will be talking primarily about the state of the Sustainable Development Goal 14, known as SDG 14, which, as you know, is our universal goal to conserve and sustainably use the ocean's resources. In the course of these remarks, I'll be drawn into the surge towards the sustainable blue economy, which is now so evident around the world. As the world emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic, it is crucial for the future of our kind on this planet that we ride this surge towards a healthy ocean. It comes at the right time, for there can be no healthy planet without a healthy ocean. And the ocean's health has been measurably in decline for some time now. I won't go too much into that decline in my remarks today, but in case you're not fully aware, we, and I mean all of us, have been party to driving the decline in the ocean's health. Thus, it would be disingenuous were I to ignore it in what I have to say today. But first, I ask you to consider how we're going to stop that decline. To start with, we must govern our activities with a logical and ethical dedication to sustainability. We need to agree that the time has come to accept that linear exploitation of finite planetary resources is a dead end street. And we've reached a point on humanity's path whereupon global transformation to circular recycling systems of production and consumption has become a straightforward matter of survival or not. What more must we do? We ha will have to muster courage and grasp the, the nettle of international consensus that is so sorely required at international gatherings these days. The UNFCCC COP26 in Glasgow made solid progress but there remains much more to achieve. And we have begun working towards COP27 in Egypt for improving on targets to reach net zero carbon ahead of 2050. In Geneva in two weeks time at the WTO ministerial meeting, we must be prepared to set aside selfish national interests and agree once and for all to remove harmful fisheries subsidies, the scourge of marine ecosystems. In Nairobi in February, at the UN Environment Assembly, we must be ready to commence negotiations for an internationally binding treaty to end the plague of plastic pollution that we've unleashed upon nature. In Kunming in April at the UN Biodiversity Conference, we must adopt a target to conserve 30% of the planet's surface by 2030. And at the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon at the end of June next year, we must be ready to put in place the science-based solutions necessary to stop the decline in the ocean's health. Sometimes it seems that all this multilateral talk is too slow, too nationalistic, too often resulting in stalemate. But we have to ask ourselves what the alternative is, and I've yet to hear an answer to that question that would be palatable to the majority of us. Multilateralism ultimately works, and I say that as a former president of the UN General Assembly, who has on many occasions witnessed its stuttering progress. It is true that the private sector and some progressive countries move ahead of international consensus, with hydrogen-powered shipping a very good current example. And as long as no laws are broken, I think we can all agree that this is as it should be. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to expand a little on the subject of the next UN Ocean Conference. Under universal mandate from all 193 member states of the United Nations, the conference will be co-hosted by the governments of Portugal and Kenya in Lisbon, 27 June to 1st of July. I hope to see many of you there. The UN Ocean Conferences exist to maintain the integrity of the implementation of SDG 14. Those of you who were present at the first UN Ocean Conference in New York in 2017 Witness the bringing together of many thousands of representatives of countries and civil society, science, youth, and the business sector in a groundbreaking show of inclusiveness within the UN campus. 
It resulted in a great rising of global consciousness on the state of the ocean's health and the need for urgent action to support the targets of SDG 14. I've witnessed in the intervening four years, a great flowering of action oriented programs and organizations and movements and meetings, all concerned to put in place the measures required to achieve SDG 14. So how are we doing on the implementation of SDG 14? In summary, not very well. And I've pointed to that in the opening salvo of my remarks today. Lest there remains doubt in anyone's mind, I ingrain the fact that SDG 14's nemesis is humankind's continuing burning of fossil fuels. The massive scale at which we burn fossil fuels, creating the greenhouse gases blanketing our atmosphere are commensurately changing the composition of the ocean. The ocean has absorbed 90% of the heat from global temperature rises. So it should not be a surprise that immense changes are underway and that we now witness such phenomena as escalating marine heat waves and the death of coral reefs. The IPCC has reported that 70 to 90% of existing tropical reef coral reefs will be lost once we go through 1.5 degrees warming and that virtually all will be gone at two degrees. One asks, how can you have a healthy ocean when 25% of its biodiversity is taken out in the form of tropical coral reefs? Coupled with ocean warming and the resulting expansion of H2O, Global atmospheric warming is causing melting ice sheets to pour into the ocean, with the result that rising sea levels are increasingly inundating low-lying coastal areas. It's quite tragic to contemplate that if present trends continue, the 21st century will witness widespread saltwater engulfment of low-lying land, of atolls and river deltas that for thousands of years have been home to biodiversity, food production, and unique manifestations of human culture. Ladies and gentlemen, in the face of this situation, member states of the United Nations have instituted the UN Decade of Ocean Science, which commenced this year, with the aim of amassing knowledge of the ocean's scientific properties. It's estimated that the majority of these remain unknown to science. And in their collective wisdom, as I've said, the member states have also mandated the second UN Ocean Conference to be held in Lisbon in uh, late June next year. The mandated theme for the conference is scaling up ocean action based on science and innovation for the implementation of SDG 14, stock taking, partnerships and solutions. And I have no doubt that like the first UN Ocean Conference in 2017, the Lisbon Conference in 2022 will be an ocean action game changer for the world based on that wise mantra we've been given of science, solutions and partnerships. Ladies and gentlemen, SDG 14 is a noble pursuit for us all to follow, a pursuit that has at its heart the sustainable blue economy and an underlying ethos of living in harmony with Mother Nature. It is thus that I mention that following on from the impetus generated by the Sustainable Blue Economy Conference that was held in Nairobi back in 2018, the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon will keep the focus on the sustainable blue economy. On the shoulders of the conference, we are organizing a sustainable blue economy investment forum in the adjoining city of Cascais, which will have huge business sector relevance and focus. And I'm sure that will be of interest to many Irish companies. Many believe that in the not too distant future, the sustainable blue economy will be the basis of human security. And as a loving grandfather, I count myself amongst them. At COP26 in Glasgow, I repeatedly stated in my speeches that we must move the climate finance needle in the direction of the sustainable blue economy. And I'm pleased to say there's early evidence that the needle is moving. We don't want millions or billions of dollars to flow into the sustainable blue economy. We want trillions of dollars. Why? because we need those dollars to secure the health of the ocean and thereby the planet and thereby the well-being of our grandchildren. We need the trillions of dollars to decarbonize the global shipping fleet and the ports that service it, funding a transformation that has already begun moving from powering our ships with the filth of bunker oil to pollution-free green hydrogen. We need the trillions of dollars invested to feed the future 
through sustainable aquaculture and farming the ocean to produce new, sustainable, nutritious forms of future food, seaweeds, phytoplanktons, and other ethical, non-fed forms of aquaculture. We need the trillions for the scientific research of the ocean that will help us understand the currently unknown properties that will secure our health in the post-antibiotic age. And we need the trillions because if we invest now in offshore energy, in wind, tidal, wave, and other ocean technologies, we'll have all the renewable energy we need many times over to power our ways of life. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude my remarks, I reaffirm that in the context of the COVID-19 recovery, the transformative power of sustainable blue economy holds especially true for small island developing states. I was therefore very pleased in my meeting with the Irish Foreign Minister, Simon Coveney, at COP26 in Glasgow last week, to hear that the Irish international development agenda places a high priority on supporting small island developing states as part of its A Better World strategy, and that the strategy specifically commits to supporting interventions directly related to the ocean and the blue economy. This is true to the word spirit and shared values of the Our Ocean Wealth Summit that the Irish government hosted for small island developing state representatives in Cork in 2019 that I was privileged to attend. The support given then by the Irish government to the existential concerns of small island developing states was deeply appreciated. And it was doubly noticed and appreciated at COP26. And so as an island man, I say, long may the partnerships established in, in Cork endure, building momentum as we battle on with the many challenges posed by the cl climate and ocean crisis. My personal commitment to assisting Ireland in the implementation of the goals set within these partnerships may be taken as a given. And I thank you for your attention and look forward to the Q&A session. Peter, thank you very, very much for that uh, uh, inspiring uh, exposition, um, both on SDG 14 and on the, 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 the wider uh, challenges we face in relation to uh, conservation, protection of the ocean. Um, Peter, you were at, I'll begin the, the Q&A session, if I may, but with a question of my own. You were at COP last week. What was your, your sense of the impact which the final text will have on the chances of achieving SDG 14? I mean, how do you assess the contribution that COP has made to SDG 14? Sorry, I'm a little bit slow on answering because I'm unmuting my video because I've got a building okay. right next door. <laughs> so if you get the occasional skill saw or drill, you know what's happening. Look, uh, it was an interesting COP. Uh, it was very different from any that I'd been to before. Um, you know, I think there was, the, the big difference was that those that used to come to the COPs basically to white out the process, uh, for their own selfish interests or simply because they were flat earthers and believed that the whole thing was a hoax. That's just gone away now. I mean, they've gone off to their luxury villas or wherever it is that they are seeing out their days. And, and th there wasn't that element present at all at COP26. It was all about what a, we've got a massive existential crisis. What are the solutions to get out of it? And that's what our time was taken up in. Uh, the solutions. And I think that that is the name of the game going forward to, to Egypt and, and thereafter. But to answer your specific question, um, and just those that don't go to these COPs should be aware that there's sort of two elements to all COPs. One is the inner element where a text is being negotiated between the parties, the parties being, you know, the parties to the convention. And the, they're, they're nations, of course, our, our national representatives. And then outside of that uh, inner sanctum is where the majority of uh, activity, let's say, at the COP is taking place, which is all these side events and uh, you know people coming along displaying the latest renewable uh, energy technology, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, there's a huge amount of exchange of information goes on there. So, in, what I was just saying about how different this COP is, 
it was in both those two spheres that you could see that, uh, that great difference. I give credit to the UK government uh, in terms of the leadership by the COP president that in the text side of things, the negotiation of the text, there was leadership shown which, um, from our point of view, the ocean community got us through the door and up to the top table where we have long been saying that the ocean belongs. Why do we say that? Because the climate is the creation of the atmosphere and the ocean. And not to have the ocean in a climate meeting is just sort of leaving out 50% of the equation. So that's why we've been banging on that door all these years. And, 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 and in the last COP in Madrid, the door slightly opened for us. And as you know, the, there was subsequent high level dialogue in Substa uh, on the ocean and climate. And so the door was open for us there, but this COP, we really got inside. And if you look at the text, you will see that um, there's, there's a strong language there, which, which will not go away now. Uh, so I'm feeling very grateful for all those who made that possible. Many governments have contributed over the years. I think of Fiji and Sweden, I think of Chile, and uh, as I say, the UK government has done a great job. Peter, thanks very much. Um, a question from Mary Gallagher, who asks, does Ambassador Thompson think that SDG 14 should be included in national tourism policies and strategies? That's a very interesting question, because you know I think the whole area of tourism, and I have to be careful what I say here, because it doesn't foreign exchange in my own country is heavily dominated by tourism. We've been suffering badly during the COVID epidemic as a result. Um, <laughs> and just to do a little segue, my first paying job was as a boatman at a uh, island resort in Fiji, um, you know, where the main thing was going up the reefs and snorkeling and things. Like that. And I remember how bad people's practices were in those days, you know, people would break off coral to take it home as souvenirs or anchors would go crashing down on uh, beautiful coral reefs. Um, you know, people were wearing sunblock that was poisoning the coral, all that stuff, you know. So, uh, you know, I move on from that though, because I think that, you know, countries have, uh, with coral related tourism have come to treasure it, uh, if for no other reason than a revenue source from diving industry. But um, having done that little segue, I kind of forget what the question was. Can you repeat tourism, it? Tourism strategies. <laughs> right. Whether the SDG 14 should be reflected in, yeah. uh, well, it, in national tourism plans. Yeah, it is there in, uh, in relation to uh, small island developing states and least developing countries that uh, you know, there should be assistance to them in a variety of things that includes tourism. Uh, but generally speaking for the whole world, absolutely, yeah, we've, um, we've got to make sure that tourism doesn't kill the golden goose. And uh, I think it's, it's, an, it's one where, you know, we have some very big questions to ask ourselves about all this international travel. It's very middle class development that's happened during my lifetime. You know, people didn't travel around when I was a kid, uh, the way they do today. But as I said, countries have come to rely on it for their foreign exchange. So we're in a difficult position there. And we have to examine it. And I think it's a good question. It's a good suggestion. And I'm going to try and bring elements of that into the Lisbon conference. Peter, looking ahead over the next few months, and you mentioned the various uh, uh, key multinational meetings coming up, what do you see as the, the main workload? What would you be focusing on, let's say, heading up to Lisbon? Well, as you know, ocean health is my preoccupation. Um, but that Kunming meeting, as I said in my remarks, you know, the 30 by 30 is uh, for the uh, people must understand that 30 by 30 fits into the post 2020 uh, strategic framework. And there was a there was a leading up to 2020, we had this strategic framework where there were all the various targets actually that we stole from there and put in the SDGs, a lot of them. Mm, uh, yes. and it's, just, it's, it's, it's targeting that where, where the world is trying to improve its performance in these things. So the post 2021, uh, which has obviously been delayed because of COVID, is going to be adopted in Kunming in April. And part of that, one of the targets 
is this target of having 30% of the planet, land and sea, uh, conserved uh, and in, in protected areas. So, you know, that is uh, an interesting challenge for you to think about because in those previous targets that I had mentioned, which we adopted into the SDGs, one of them is uh, SDG 14.5, to have 10% of the ocean in marine protected areas by 2020. You could call that 10 by 20. Well, we didn't get there. We got to about uh, just under 8%. And uh, I, I can, would happily go on the reasons why, but I'd say principally because of the performance uh, of uh, CAMLA in, um, the, in declaring marine protected areas in the Southern Ocean is why we missed out on that 10%. But, um, you know, you have to ask yourself, is 30 by 30 achievable? We've got basically nine years thereafter to put it in place when we didn't get to 10 by 20. But, you know, is there a reason to back off the goal? No, absolutely not. And I think one of the mechanisms that we can bring in as far as the ocean is concerned is to, um, under the BBNJ conference, which listeners may know, it refers to the, an, a, a, a UN conference that has been underway for a number of years and hopefully going to conclude early next year. BBNJ for uh, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdictions, it stands for. That under that treaty that will emerge from that conference, that we will have the ability to declare marine protected areas in the high seas and, and enforce them. So that's where I think our missing, let's say 20% that we haven't got to yet uh, will come from, from the high seas. Great, Peter, thank you very much. Um, question here from Dara Moriarty of the Institute. You, you described fossil fuels as the arch nemesis of SDG 14. Uh, in this context, how disappointed were you to see India successfully uh, getting the change made to the final text uh, about um, about phasing phasing out going to phasing down? You know, it, it was a big disappointment. It wasn't just India, but um, the, you know, the fact is we're all in this together. And uh, I think the other really important point that I always make and, uh, is that you can't cherry pick the SDGs. And, and as one of the guiders of that process, David, you know, it's an integrated whole. It's not something where we just sort of came up with random ideas. It's a package. And so for countries that are struggling with poverty, uh, they can't imagine that, you know, that the world's gonna come rushing their assistance or that we're gonna achieve those poverty goals if we're prepared to, you know, overlook other goals such as SDG 13 of getting climate change under control. And the only way we're gonna get climate change under control is to stop burning fossil fuels, coal principally. And uh, therefore, yeah, it's disappointing. But as I said in my remarks, consensus is the way we move forward. We have to respect our differences and come to consensus. But, you know, uh, grandchildren are grandchildren, whatever country they live in. And grandchildren are being convicted to a world of three degrees at the moment. And coal has a huge part to play in that three degrees world, whether we use it or not. Three degrees of world on fire. We, don't, we, we should not be party convicting our grandchildren of that. And we have the ability by stopping burning coal to uh, turn the corner on that and, and give them the security that intergenerational justice demands they have. Apart from that, Peter, that um, what we love in life, you know, why, why, exactly. why on earth do we exist if we don't love our grandchildren? Absolutely. No, I mean, you know, it comes through quite strongly, I think, in the messaging from, from COP as well and, and the outcome. What was the overall mood among the small island developing state representatives there, if you can, if you can you know, form a view. Uh, I mean, you, as you say, the, the, the ocean community as such got to the top table, but was there sort of general satisfaction or kind of a realistic sense that this is the best SIDS could get for the moment? I mean, how would you reflect their, their, their overall reaction to the summit? Look for SIDS, it's like all developing countries. You know, we need the funds to do the adaptation. And uh, 
uh, I don't want to point fingers, but you know, we all know where the greenhouse gases have come from. And we all know where the, most of the money is on this planet. And that money needs to be channeled, channeled to developing countries so they can undertake the adaptation required uh, in the face of what's coming at us. So uh, there was a bit of disappointment there, but as I said to you before, that I feel the climate finance needle moving in the direction of the sustainable blue economy. And for SIDS, where the SIDS should take heart, and I've said this to them, is that when it comes to sustainable blue economy, you know, they are great ocean states and they stand to benefit hugely from the sustainable blue economy. Therefore, moving that climate finance needle in the direction of the sustainable blue economy is going to be to their ultimate benefit. And, you know, I, for example, uh, I had meetings recently with the the CEOs of both the Green Climate Fund and the Global Environment Facility, and they both are very committed to this movement as well. And you saw uh, the beginnings of that with the 125 million that the Green Climate Finance Board last month allocated towards the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, which is run by UNDP. You know, serious money starting to go into uh, protection and restoration of coral reefs. Peter, I have a question also about your reaction to um, the, the disappointing outcome in terms of the loss and damage uh, at, at the summit. In other words, uh, a perception that the wealthy countries were uh, uh, unwilling to recognize a fuller responsibility to uh, developing countries in this area. I know it goes slightly beyond SDG 14 as such, but did you get a sense that there was uh, widespread unhappiness uh, 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 that more wasn't done in that area. Yes, definitely true. Uh, but as I said in my opening remarks, you know, multilateralism is a process. Uh, the main thing for developing countries and SIDS is they don't back off on that demand because it's a legitimate demand. They didn't cause this problem. And uh, therefore, it's legitimate that they, it's, it's a compensation basically for. <laughs> not for people to go on uh, nice holidays to the Riviera, it's to build sea walls and to build uh, alternate energy sources and, and, and food security and so on. That's what the money is going to be spent on for their people. Thanks, Peter. Um, a question from Anthony Brogan. Uh, do you think that a special report is acquired from the uh, IPCC about ocean currents? Uh, uh, the example is given of uh, AMOC, I have to say this is new to me, but Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. Uh, given that uh, any changes to the AMOC uh, represent a potential tipping point uh, on climate. Very interesting question. Uh, you know, I remember 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, doing a lot of research on in this area. Um, I don't know what I think I was writing a book or something. Uh, but that was like a science fiction thing, this slowing of the Gulf Stream and all that. It just seemed like a science fiction scenario. And no. now we're seeing evidence of it. So that's where the question is coming to you there. It's, it's you know, somebody who's looking at the evidence and saying, my God, this could have you know, huge consequences, for example, for Scandinavia and uh, Ireland and uh, Scotland, the west coast of Scotland and so on. You know, civilizations that have been built up really on the back of the warmth of the Gulf Stream. And if the Gulf Stream is already being shown to be slowing, you know, uh, and the, the inversion that's been referred to happens. Um, I don't know. I, I've had discussions recently on this. And I'm assured that we should not be overly concerned. Uh, but, you know, that's no reason for some good scientific research not to be carried out. Not so uh, yeah. I would not put the question off in any way. And uh, I would say, you know, this is something for wider discussion. Obviously, before you set the IPCC to task, you've got to um, uh, assemble your argument very clearly. But I think there's enough there. It's not just the North Atlantic affected, of course, it's uh, all around the world. You know, in our part of the world down the Southwest Pacific, currents and temperatures and other factors that are part of climate change are causing the tuna through no fault of ours, the tuna are just going to migrate out of our region in the 21st century. Three of the five commercial species are leaving. They're going across the South American coast. 
you know, for a country like Tuvalu, that's 90% of its foreign exchange. Uh, just yeah. saying, sorry guys, conditions no longer suitable, we're gone. So these, these changes in ocean conditions uh, have huge impact on human societies. And it's a good, very good question, I would say, uh, worthy of development. Okay, but um, question from Stephen Frayn of the Institute. Uh, do you believe that European Union countries, uh, through policies such as the European Green Deal and the Common Fisheries Policy, are heading in the right direction in terms of implementation of SDG 14? I do, but you know, I don't think that the EU should get too self-congratulatory on yeah. this. Uh, I don't think there's any grounds for that. But uh, you know, I've had talks with Mr. Timmermans, and uh, you know, I'm I'm full of admiration for the EU Green Deal. Yeah. Um, question from Nian McDonough. Uh, well, it's it's more kind of a perhaps directed to all of us really, what, what can we learn from our response to the pandemic, uh, which we can apply to the, the climate crisis, to the existential threat for SIDS and to the protection and restoration of the oceans? I mean, are there lessons to be learned from how the world has been reacting to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? Sadly, one of the uh, reactions has been a re-embracement of plastic and plastic pollution. Uh, that we as a species of sort of, you know, I wouldn't say panic, but in our um, fear of what the COVID-19 represents, we have happily re-embraced plastic as the best way of keeping ourselves, uh, you know, wrapped and all the rest. Uh, so what I would say is that we have to be braver. We have to look at what we actually are doing with plastic in that regard uh, to ourselves, to our children. Uh, anybody who hasn't heard about what microplastics are doing needs to read up on them. They're entering our bodies and going across the blood brain barrier and in through placental tissue and all the rest. You know, I'm sorry, but uh, anybody who doesn't know about that needs to upskill a bit. But in terms of building back better, as the saying goes, uh, yeah, there's so much that we can do not to repeat old habits. And I give that plastic as an example. But um, it's going to be a struggle. Let's, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. But it's why I said to earlier in my remarks, we must be prepared to spend the trillions. OK, we all had relatives who died in the Spanish flu epidemic. And this is similar to that. Uh, we didn't have the same kind of money to spend that we have on this one. Uh, but the fact is, it's a blip on the human path. But what we have come to in terms of our destruction of nature is not a blip. It's an existential moment that humanity is facing in the 21st century. And we have to make a move akin to the move from the Stone Age to whatever came next. Was it the Iron Age or the Iron Age, the Bronze Age? I've forgotten my education. But <laughs> we have to make that move from the Industrial Age to the recyclable, recycling age. And it's of the same scale. It's global revolutionary shift or uh, suffer the bitter consequences. Yes, yeah. Um, Peter, a question here about uh, ocean governance. Uh, what scope do you see for sustainable ocean plans uh, to, to manage the ocean area that each country has within its own national jurisdiction? Well, uh, some of you may have heard of the um, High Level Panel for Sustainable Ocean Economy, which has been working for the last four years. It's 14 heads of government and when I say heads of government, I mean that. They, they, they attend in their personal capacity. You know, the president of Indonesia, the prime minister of Japan, the uh, president of Chile, the prime minister of Portugal, uh, the prime minister of Norway and the president of Palau, co-chair, prime minister of Fiji's member. Uh, on I go. There were 14 of them. And in fact, in our meeting, because I'm a, a sort of honorary member of the panel to represent the UN, um, in our meeting in um, Glasgow, uh, we were joined by Senator John Kerry, 
uh, who announced that President Biden would also be joining this high level panel. And I understand President Macron is also considering. Uh, so uh, the point I'm making here is that this is a very high level panel which has commissioned vast amount of scientific report, uh, work over the last four years. I can think of actually no other movement uh, of, of a similar scale in the last four years in terms of uh, addressing the problems of the ocean. Anyway, um, the main outcome of all that work was a commitment by the 14 heads of government that their countries would all have in place sustainable ocean plans within their EEZs by 2025, and they encouraged all of their peers around the world, all other country leaders of other countries, to at least by 2030 have 100% coverage of uh, EEZs uh, by sustainable ocean plans. Now, why is that important? It's it, plans, uh, first of all, they have to be science based. So we're talking again, a mantra here of science, planning, finance. Nobody's gonna give you money if you haven't got a decent plan and that plan has to be based on science. So uh, this, the, the, the development of the sustainable blue economy, which as I say is the future of humanity uh, has to be based on good plans. Peter, um, how, how organized is, is civil society activism uh, on the oceans, uh, you know, around the world? Um, uh, I presume that they were much in evidence uh, during COP26. But I mean, here, for example, there was a, a rather striking uh, demonstration about a month ago uh, with a slogan, if the seas die, we die, and with people carrying kind of mock coffins through the streets of Dublin, etc. But I'm just I'm just wondering how you assess the, the effectiveness of civil society players on this issue. Well, uh, you'll recall what I was saying there about the first UN Ocean Conference and how it, inclusive it was and how civil society was you know, a huge part of its success. You know, obviously, civil society was active on ocean matters prior to 2017, but that UN Ocean Conference really uh, unlock the floodgates. And uh, in the intervening four years, you've seen this real flowering of uh, civil society action around the ocean. Uh, I think politicians have latched on to it, um, uh, some disingenuously, um, you know, they're not prepared to do the hard yards on things like stopping bottom trawling or declaring marine protected areas and so on, but they will always make sure that their remarks are always uh, say nice things about the ocean. Why? Because the ocean's our mother, you know, and if you're going to insult the ocean or, you know, or dismiss it or whatever, people obviously aren't going to like it. So no politician nowadays says anything bad about the ocean. Hmm. So uh, then what is the future of all this as far as civil society is concerned? Well, absolutely, they have to apply themselves. And what I really like seeing in, in civil society now is the way that the youth are so engaged in uh, ocean action. Uh, because that's obviously what's going to carry us into the future. Yeah, I have a little granddaughter living with me here in London. Uh, she's uh, her grandmother's uh, indigenous Fijian, and it just burns me up to think that, that this island, you know, ringed by a coral reef where my family has lived for generations, and her grandmother's family have lived for thousands of years, will have no living coral around it if we continue on this path that is set for us now. And that's not some sort of prophet of doom stuff. This is the IPCC telling us that and WMO telling us that. And so we really got to wake up and, you know, I want my granddaughter to be able to snorkel the way I did through coral canyons of beautiful fish and, and uh, just see that teeming life. But uh, yeah, we've got a lot of work to do to make that happen. Exactly. Peter, a question here about uh, a debate that we've been having in Ireland recently about uh, applying for observer status uh, in the Arctic Council. I mean, I know it's, it's one part of, the, uh, of your brief, as it were, but um, what role do you see for the uh, Arctic Council in protecting the wealth of uh, oceans, preserving the wealth? Well, I think you can double that question up and, and, and say Kamlar as well for the, the South Pole. Um, and 
What interests me is the Arctic Council and, and CAMLA, uh, both made up of um, uh, member countries, and that those member countries, are a very small minority of us involved, right? In the Arctic Council, it's a bit more clear because it's countries that are within the Arctic Circle. Uh, but at the same time, you know, they are, in a sense, they are stewards for the rest of us. And if the rest of us look on and say, well, these guys are doing a lousy job, you know, for example, these marine protected areas in the Southern Ocean, when they've been scientifically proven to be uh, required, uh, Kamlar agreed many, many moons ago that there should uh, be a program for increasing marine protected areas down there. But for, for four years now, we've been absolutely stalled, blocked, meeting after meeting. No, no, can't be done. So uh, what I would say, is, you know, coming from a small island developing state is, you know, the questions being asked is, why the heck are we leaving it to these guys to uh, decide on marine protected areas in the poles when the, there's only one ocean and what happens there directly affects us in terms of our marine life, in terms of our sea levels, et cetera. One ocean. So that question is being asked. And I would say both the Arctic Council and the CAMLA, you know, you're being watched by the rest of us and we expect to see responsibility being exercised. Yes, I think, um, I mean, the the general issue of climate justice you, you touched on, uh, it, it has come through very strongly from COP and in the messaging. And obviously Mary Robinson here has been a, 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 a leading champion on that subject and, you know, responsibility towards the, the young, towards today's generation is a major part of that. Um, can I come back to the, the issue of private sector investment uh, in the um, uh, in the sustainable blue economy? When you were um, president of the General Assembly, I remember that you organized in a, a kind of an intensive, uh, felt like a week of time was the amount of activity, but an intensive focus on SDG 14 and its wider potential. Do you think that COP has all, COP 26 has also directed attention uh, uh, more vigorously to the commercial opportunities which exist for business in uh, uh, in, in, in developing sustainable blue economy. I mean, I wasn't there, but I, I'd like to think almost that um, that the private sector uh, uh, involvement, which will be essential for building that economy, I'd like to think that it is now more fully uh, recognised. Yes, uh, the first event that I spoke at in Glasgow uh, two weeks ago was a shipping event, getting uh, global shipping to zero emissions. And, you know, I gave my usual polemics. Um, but then the next speaker was the representative of the a big ferry company in Scandinavia. And it struck me that, you know, he was so far ahead of everything I'd just said, mm. and that, you know, his company, which was putting out tenders for uh, hydrogen powered ferries and was putting out tenders for a hydrogen production plant and was putting out tenders for uh, bunkering facilities for hydrogen and I think 15 ports up the coast. You know, that they're so far ahead of governments, uh, private sector and so many of these things. And you know, I find that very uplifting uh, because I think it's probably always the way things have been, you know, um, and entrepreneurship and and uh, you know the exercise of, of, of proper responsible capitalism uh, is what's taken us forward. It's not government's uh, policies. Government policies usually followed, uh, and the two ideally the two go hand in hand. And there's obviously an enabling role for things like the transition to green hydrogen uh, that governments have to play, but it's it's private sector um, and that is obviously true for the health sector as well. Uh, you know, we wouldn't have got there in our COVID uh, via, uh, the uh, vaccination thing without the private sector. Uh, it's obviously true in the food sector, uh, especially, and one of the most fascinating conversations I had was sitting next to the chap who's the uh, founder of Impossible Meats, you know, who make the uh, plant-based hamburgers that are now 
uh, widespread around the world, now making impossible pork and impossible chicken and selling that into Asia and so on, all plant-based. You know, imagine a government trying to do that. It just wouldn't happen. So that's private sector. And as I say, ahead of the game, uh, as long as no laws are being broken, then uh, it's the way it should be, I guess. Yeah. You know, that brings us towards the end uh, um, of the uh, session, unfortunately. And um, um, I'd like to thank you warmly for taking the time. I know you, you, you're between major conferences as where you've hardly been able to catch breath. But thank you very, very much for speaking to the Institute today and sharing your, your, your insights. Um, uh, we look forward very much to seeing you in person back here when, when um, uh, circumstances permit. Um, I'm sure I speak for Rory de Birkin in saying that Ireland will continue to be uh, uh, very, very supportive of what you're doing and our, the Irish Aid Programme will, will, uh, uh, will continue with the priorities which Simon Coveney outlined to you. So uh, you, you can rest assured of that. But on behalf of the Institute, I'd like to thank you very, very much for um, talking to us today and uh, covering such a, a, a vast spectrum of issues. So thanks a lot, Peter. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Appreciate that, David. And, uh, and I say again, thank you to Ireland for staying true to its word in what it's doing with the small island developing states. Uh, and I look forward to seeing uh, many of my Irish friends in Lisbon uh, end of June awesome. next year.